what happened to Josh Osborne when he was 14 years old has all of the makings of a horror story. Things started to go wrong after a vacation to Puerto Rico. While in Puerto Rico, Josh and his family saw a dead dog lying on the beach. Upon returning home to the United States, Josh's friend was briefly hospitalized with fever and bloody urine. Josh himself started to, to experience fever, headaches, chills, inflammation of his eyes, and was eventually diagnosed with an autoimmune condition called ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, in which he developed bleeding spots underneath his skin. Over four months, Josh was admitted to the hospital three times, spent 44 days in the intensive care unit, underwent more than 100 inconclusive diagnostic tests. He uh, underwent a, an invasive brain biopsy, which was unrevealing. And ultimately, he became critically ill and needed to be placed in a medically induced coma for intractable seizures. But his doctor still couldn't figure out what was going wrong, what was wrong. In fact, more than a year passed by without a diagnosis. Now, Josh's case is indeed a horror story, but sadly, it's not really that unusual. 20 to 25 percent of the time, we're unable to diagnose infections, pneumonia in intensive care unit patients, despite extensive conventional testing. For fever and bloodstream infections, otherwise known as sepsis, it's 30 percent. And the percentage of the time that we're unable to diagnose cases of meningitis and encephalitis in acutely ill hospitalized patients, a whopping 50 to 75 percent of the time. So let's go back to Josh. What you can see here is an MRI scan of Josh's brain. And uh, highlighted in arrows, the arrows point to rim enhancement of the cisterns or the fluid spaces in his brain that are bathed in spinal fluid. This enhancement is a telltale sign of meningitis. But unfortunately, it's not very helpful in making the diagnosis. In fact, the radiologist's read of this particular scan was that these findings represent an infectious or inflammatory process. So good to know, good to know, but unfortunately, it's not giving you the diagnosis. So at this point, Josh was critically ill with a mysterious, life-threatening infection. He desperately needed targeted treatment, and he needed it fast. Many of you may be aware of the promise of precision medicine and how it has revolutionized the way we now diagnose and treat cancer and hereditary diseases. By sequencing the genome, uh, we can provide personalized treatment for patients, for a patient's individual tumor or for a patient's individual genetic mutation. I and we would like to do the same for acute infectious diseases in cases such as Josh's. Our approach for precision diagnosis of infectious diseases is called metagenomic next-generation sequencing. Metagenomic next-generation sequencing. Instead of using a fishing pole attached to a bob to look for individual infectious agents that have to be defined a priori, our approach is to cast a wide net to be able to capture and detect any and all pathogens, no matter whether they're viruses, bacteria, fungi, or even parasites. Unlike conventional clinical testing, such as culture, in which you grow the organism to identify the cause of an infection, and unlike conventional clinical tests, which often uh, are quite laborious and also require you to use very limited amounts of sample and send test after test after test in an often fruitless attempt to search for infectious agents, metagenomics next generation sequencing encompasses all of this in a single test. And by doing so, we can provide timely, targeted, and effective therapy for patients by virtue of earlier and more accurate diagnoses. Now, you can think of metagenomic next-generation sequencing as a needle in a haystack approach to diagnosis. What we do is we take a clinical sample, whether it's blood, respiratory secretions, spinal fluid, even tissue, and we generate hundreds to millions of sequence reads, DNA sequence reads, on a high-throughput instrument. Next, we analyze these reads for any and all sequences corresponding to potential pathogens. This is the needle in the haystack, or finding the needle in the haystack approach. To do this, my laboratory has developed a computational pipeline called SERPI. SERPI, S-U-R-P-I, stands for Sequence-Based Ultra-Rapid Pathogen Identification. 
The SERPI computational pipeline is able to analyze 300 million sequences in under three hours. And it is now available on a server, on the cloud, and even on a laptop. We received Josh's sample on a Friday, and we had the diagnosis 48 hours later. The SERPI computational pipeline had identified a pathogen, the cause of Josh's illness, that had eluded all prior conventional clinical testing. And this is the answer. What you're seeing here is a heat map showing the output of the SERPI computational black box pipeline. Shown in the leftmost column is Josh's spinal fluid, the DNA directly extracted from his spinal fluid. You can see at a glance that Josh was infected by a rare bacterium called Leptospira. Leptospirosis is a bacterial infection that's acquired by contact with infected water sources. Uh, and these are water sources contaminated with animal urine. What had happened is Josh probably got infected in Puerto Rico, where he had been playing in the lakes and the streams, or had been swimming in the lakes and the streams, and had been infected by this particular organism. However, the sequencing data not only gave you the identity of the cause of organism, but you can even name the strain. He had a rare strain called Leptospira santerosi, which is actually human cases of this bug have only been found in three areas of the world, Taiwan, South America, and yes, Puerto Rico and other islands of the Caribbean. Thankfully, we were able to make the diagnosis before it was too late. Um, the optimal treatment for Josh, why it actually was penicillin, our oldest antibiotic. With appropriate treatment, Josh's seizures resolved in 12 hours, and he was actually out of the hospital in good condition within four weeks. What I'd like to show you is actually hearing from Josh a few months after his recovery and his diagnosis. Being at my home with my family alive is probably one of the most amazing feelings a boy can get. Well, Josh's case, as I said before, is by no means unusual. However, we would like to make it rare or even non-existent. And how are we going to do that? Well, in 2016 of June, June of 2016, we launched a study called Precision Diagnosis of Acute Infectious Diseases. This is a multi-hospital nationwide study that aims to enroll 300 patients over one year and directly compare the metagenomic next-generation sequencing test, which has now been licensed in a clinical laboratory, the UCSF Clinical Micro Lab, against conventional clinical testing. Akin to a tumor board, which is commonly used for cancer patients, we have established a clinical microbial sequencing board consisting of a number of individuals, pathologists, infectious disease physicians, neurologists, primary care doctors, bioinformaticists, and others, to review cases and to integrate the sequencing data with the clinical and laboratory data to provide personalized diagnosis and recommendations for managing patients with acute infectious diseases. It is our hope that, by doing so, that we may be able to provide more timely and earlier diagnoses for these patients and be able to get them treatment before it's too late. Our efforts are particularly timely given that the FDA, just this year in May, uh, issued draft guidance for regulation of diagnostic sequencing devices, such as this one. And it is our hope that tests such as the metagenomic next generation sequencing assay that we've developed can be approved and made available to benefit patients as soon as possible. But is this technology only available in the developed world, or is it also going to be available in low-resource settings in poor countries? Well, the uh, Minion Nanopore sequencer, which I actually have in my pocket, is a potential game changer in this regard. This is a pocket-sized, small, portable net sequencing device. And it's powered by the USB port in your laptop. Um, as DNA is guided through small pores in a semi-permeable membrane, electrical conductance changes can enable you to, do, to, to generate sequencing data in real time. We have been developing protocols and developing software to do real-time nanopore sequencing analysis of clinical samples in point-of-care settings. What you can see here is uh, in a movie showing, after a three-hour sample preparation protocol, analysis of a patient sample containing HIV-1 and Zika virus. So this is a patient infected with these viruses. You can see that after starting sequencing, we can detect HIV in under three minutes and lower 
concentration Zika virus in under 13 minutes. In collaboration with a number of national and international collaborators, what we are doing is we have actually placed these devices in numerous areas around the world, including uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Barbados, Brazil. And the goal is not only to be able to use this to diagnose patient infections in point-of-care settings, but also to search and do public health surveillance for emerging infections, including Ebola virus, Zika virus, and Borrelia burgdorferi, the cause of Lyme disease. But it doesn't really stop there. We're actually also doing, as you can see in this slide, sequencing in space and collaborating on efforts to sequence in space. And uh, in August of this year, astronaut Kate Rubens reported for the first time successful sequencing, nanopore sequencing in, on the International Space Station. Now, you may ask, why would we be interested in sequencing in space? Well, for several reasons. One is that we might be able to diagnose infections in astronauts um, so they don't have to return to ground to, receive, to get diagnosed and receive treatment. One is also for environmental surveillance aboard the International Space Station. And yes, uh, perhaps we can also uh, sequence in space to be able to identify and characterize extraterrestrial life. One of the core truths of any battle, no matter whether you're two boxers fighting in a ring or a group of physicians trying to diagnose and cure a patient, is that, quote, you can't hit what you can't see. Well, the time is soon coming when we will be able to see much farther, much faster, and much better than ever before. So when a parent walks into the emergency room asking, what is wrong with my child? What is making my child sick? We'll have an answer. We'll be able to get it quickly, and we'll be able to get it right. The time is soon coming when we will be able to see the promise of precision medicine being fulfilled on a daily basis, as we will be able to save patients routinely from the scourge of acute infectious diseases. Thank you.